let's see, okay, record on this computer. Recording, it says it's recording. So, yeah. great, okay. I'm Vance Stevens and I'm in Malaysia, Penang, Malaysia, which is, there's a big rainstorm going out there. We were sitting on our balcony watching that come in. I'm gonna post all these lightning pictures on Facebook. But um, anyway, uh, back indoors now, and uh, I'm talking with Karen Schwartz, and this is May 11th, 2020, and this is Learning Together event, uh, episode number 461. So we've been doing this for 10 years, and it's also Talon, uh, a Talon teaching and learning in isolation. I think it's our 14th episode, something like that might be 15th, I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, uh, Karen has produced some very interesting materials about teaching. Um, you, you, I'll just see if I get it right. Okay, so you're teaching English and I think literature also, is that correct? Um, for the curriculum or do you mean just in my background context. or? Your context, uh-huh. What, what do you what do you do? Yeah, yeah. So um, I have taught English in the past. I have a bachelor's in English or an English education and a master's in English. And I have taught writing at the college level as a graduate instructor and an online adjunct. I also taught English as a foreign language in Korea, mm -hmm. and I've also taught high school English um, at a rural school out here in the United. States. Mm -hmm. um, after being in education for a few years, I transitioned into educational technology and I worked at a company called Tinker, which is in the learn to code space. So if you've ever heard of other uh, resources like Scratch or Code.org or mm -hmm. um, just any of those companies that have um, a, a program that teaches kids to code using block coding, Tinker is, is in that space and they have a block coding platform and hey, when I was oh no you can't do oh. that you can't, can you uh, spell out those names uh, who, where are you working you said Pinterest or something like that but I couldn't really oh have... yeah so so the company I worked at is was um, called Tinker T-Y-N-K-E-R okay mm -hmm. yeah right. so I worked there and I was responsible for um, marketing as well as for editing the coding courses and so mm -hmm. as part of my marketing work I was doing a lot of research about how coding intersects with different disciplines because mm -hmm. I had to write these articles about you know why your kids should learn to code and why mm -hmm. students should learn to code and why teachers should introduce to the classroom and things like that mm -hmm. and so as I was doing research I just found a lot of really interesting parallels between coding and English language arts and a lot of areas where they intersected, mm -hmm. such as with natural language processing and how if you could learn basic, you know, English grammar and language elements, you could write some basic programs, uh, sort of in the spirit of natural language processing, which is this subset of computer science where um, uh, you so you teach a computer system how to understand and respond to uh, human language, whether that's written input or verbal input. Mm -hmm. um, and so I ended up leaving that company and then just decided to dig more into this. And so I learned Python, which is a programming language that's used mm -hmm. a lot in natural language processing. And I learned more about um, NLP itself and computer science. And I ended up writing this GCPH curriculum uh, that basically is, is written with English teachers in mind. I was uh, kind of had in mind more, you know, the high school English teacher who wants to bring these videos into their classroom, but it mm -hmm. could also be applicable to people who are teaching English in other contexts as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just sort of based on the principle of, you know, help students review basic grammar and English language concepts and then help them start to think computationally by um, really articulating what those rules are and then teach them some basic Python and then help them build some, some basic programs with NL or with, uh, with Python based on those rules. And that by doing so, that can help reinforce their knowledge of English language as they 
start to think um, sort of categorically about language and have to, um, you know, employ some of those computational and critical thinking skills to build those programs. Okay, and that, that's how we got together because apparently, did you come on Jennifer, Jennifer Vershore and my article? Is that how? I how did, uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I was doing some research to just try to find other people who are doing research in this same space because I was looking online and I couldn't really find um, any other companies or organizations and maybe they, they are out there and I just haven't found them yet, but I couldn't mm -hmm. really find a lot of other companies or organizations that were either producing uh, products with this sort of philosophy in mind or that we're doing research with this sort of philosophy in mind. And then, yeah, I came across that article that you wrote mm -hmm. uh, with Jennifer. And it was just really interesting that you had also done some research in um, integrating coding concepts into teaching English. Yeah. And so that's why I reached out and thought, hey, maybe this is something we can talk more about or I can learn from the research and the work that you've already done. So I worked for eight years as a... Uh, teaching computing. Uh, actually, I, I was an EF, well, I have been an EFL teacher for a long time, and, and part of that ESL, he was a second language, because I worked in the States for teaching people who were moving into college, so they had to learn it as a second language. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. um, then I, up until about the, well, actually 2003, I think, I, I worked, uh, I was the uh, I'd been an EFL teacher, and then I was also an administrator at a military language institute which we started. But when that contract folded, I got a job at Petroleum Institute in Abu Dhabi. And they had two vacancies available. One was in the computing department, and one was in the EFL department. And they seemed to be amenable to considering me for either one. So I thought, well, why not? I'll go into computing. And so they hired me. and. Uh, so I, I taught, uh, before this, I had been teaching computer-assisted language learning, right? That was like what I called my field. And as I was teaching uh, computing to these EFL learners, at the engineering students at the Petroleum Institute in Abu Dhabi, uh, I was teaching them computing and coding, often coding, uh, HTML, uh, visual mm -hmm. basic, things like that. And I mm -hmm. used to call it LACL language assisted computer learning. So it was basically uh, popping that on its head. But it, uh, that's actually, that's what, well, I mean, I, I've been interested in coding and, uh, well, I mean, anyway, teaching um, coding to students gets them speaking English, gives them something to really to talk about, you know? So and, and mm -hmm. what you're looking for when you're teaching a language is to find something that students want to communicate about. So if you, if you, tack on a subject, and actually there's a whole CLIL uh, theory about that, teaching us, teaching English in conjunction with a, another topic. So um, anyway, that seems to work quite well. That was the approach that uh, I was involved in for eight years. I taught there for eight years. So mm -hmm. anyhow, well, that's how I came on that. I've done a lot of coding myself and uh, software development and stuff like that. So. Um, I wouldn't say I'm really great at it, but uh, anyhow, uh, I'm into social, uh, what I call small now, not Cal, I call it small, social media assisted language learning, and I'm, I'm retired now, so I'm, in it more, I, I'm more into teacher training. So I'm quite interested in things like what you're doing because mm -hmm. they are adaptable for multiple contexts, and one of them being English as a foreign language. And the, mm -hmm. a lot of the people who follow Learning Together, they're, some of them are English teachers, a lot of them are, and, uh, but others are edu educational technologists or there's a lot of people in uh, games. Uh, and I, I usually meet the people who, like in Minecraft, for example, uh, who are uh, uh, in the United States in secondary school, uh, you know, K to 12. So there, we, we span all kinds of people. But mm -hmm. I don't see other people clamoring to get into our waiting room. So why don't we go ahead and start the presentation? And you can, uh, yeah, like you said, you're going to stop okay. every, every so often and give me a chance to uh, chime in. Can you see the participants in the chat? Right now it's the two of them. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're, well, I might mention you're going blind. You're doing this on a cell phone. 
possibly, yeah. possibly you haven't really gotten out of bed. You just picked up your phone by the, is it six o'clock in the morning where you are? 6.15 in California. And so anyway, it doesn't really matter where you are. Uh, but anyhow, go ahead, tell us. And I'm going to put on the slideshow. I'll put on a slide share because right now people are looking at my okay. picture and your, and your icon, which is a telephone. So let me go ahead and do that share that I was doing. So this will make it, there we are. Oops, I gotta go back a couple of slides. How do I do that? Okay, here's a slider, there we go. So, okay, we are at teaching natural language processing for English classes. So go ahead, Karen, take, take it away. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks so much um, for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, I feel really honored to be connected with this um, community, and I'm really excited to, to chat here. Um, so um, I guess I will just jump in to, uh, to the presentation. So I'm going to do this in kind of a reverse order than maybe a lot of presentations are giving it. I'm going to save the kind of the context uh, of of why this is so compelling to me more towards the end. And I'm actually going to start off with the presentation with some more um, technical and meaty stuff, just kind of while um, everyone's level of concentration is maybe a little bit higher. Um, so I'm going to talk about the coding project that you can see in the first couple of slides. And this is a simile generator. And this is one of the projects that I talk about in the curriculum that next, next I slide. wrote. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell me when um, you're shifting so, slides. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So we're on the slide that says simile generator code at the top. And so what you're looking at is a program that I wrote using Python, which is a programming language. And so this is actually a program that you can have um, your students write. And it's one that uses um, natural language processing on a very basic level. Um, so let's talk about what's happening in this Python code. First off, um, I mean, Vance, you, you probably already know this, but for the benefit of people who may, be, uh, who may listen to this recording later, um, I'll just explain a little bit about variables sure. and values. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, you can think of a variable as a box, and the value is the thing that you put in the box uh, when we're talking about programming. And um, so Python is, is a language like others where we have variables and values. So in Python, the name of our variable goes on the left side of the equal sign, and the value that's assigned to that variable goes on the right side of the equal sign when we are writing a line of code. So at the very top of this program, we actually have the word import random. This means that we are importing the random module that Python has already built into it into our program. So we're just kind of drawing on this a feature that's inbuilt into, pro, into Python. And so this means that we are giving our program the ability to randomly generate some values, and we will see that at work in just a minute. So right, at, so we have that, those words, import random is our first line of code. Um, and then after that, a couple lines down, we have two variables. The first variable is called abstract underscore noun, and assigned to this variable is a value, which in this case is a list of words. And so our list constitutes the value that we're assigning to our variable. And so the words that are in this list are love, forgiveness, and patience, and penitence. And when you are building this program with your students, you can have them use whatever nouns they want. These are just the nouns that I happen to choose. Um, so below this variable, we have another variable, and this one is called concrete underscore noun. And assigned to this variable is a list of words as well. And these words are the words wind, light, the sea, and darkness. So do you have any questions so far about what's happening with the code? Well, one really interesting thing when working with students is it might, they might, it might occur to them to say, well, well, can't I just ask people to, can I prompt people for abstract nouns and prompt people for concrete nouns? Now, of course, you could do that. You can develop your program where, it would come up and would ask the user to type a few abstract nouns or concrete mm. nouns and then kind of like an ad libs game. I don't know if you're familiar with ad libs, but uh, mm -hmm. putting, building stories by getting random words, give me a noun, give me an adverb, and then creating a story that 
it's kind of nonsense, but humorous at the same time. So yeah, okay. Anyway, <laughs> but that's but I see. So so but but if the students build the, this program themselves, then they'll write in a few abstract nouns and a few concrete nouns, and uh, mm -hmm. then they can play with it and see what it produces. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it sounds like you were saying, I mean, I hadn't thought of that, but that could definitely be an approach for you have the, the user enter those things with this particular program. We're actually not requiring any user input, mm -hmm. um, but that's definitely a way that you could, you know, possibly expand it to um, have the user um, provide that input. Um, mm -hmm. sure. So, um, so below those two variables, we then have two additional variables. Um, the first one is called abstract underscore noun. And so notice that the noun in this variable name is singular. So it is a different variable than the abstract um, underscore nouns variable that we had earlier. We're dealing with separate variables here. And so with this variable, this is where we're going to use our program's ability to randomly generate some values. We have the name of our variable, which is abstract underscore noun, then equal sign, and then we have the words random dot choice, open parentheses, abstract underscore noun, close parentheses. And so this basically means that the program is going to randomly pull an item from our list of abstract nouns and assign that item as the value to the variable abstract underscore noun because so when we use that random dot choice, we're basically calling on that import random uh, module, that random module that we um, imported earlier. And we're saying, okay, random module, I want you to go to work now. Um, and I want you to pull an item from that earlier list. Um, so then right underneath that, um, so by this point, we have told the program to randomly choose an item from our list of abstract nouns and assign it as the value to our variable abstract underscore noun. And so now we're going to do the same thing with our concrete noun. So our next line of code will be concrete underscore noun equal sign random dot choice open parentheses concrete underscore noun close parentheses. And so now our program will randomly choose an item from our list of concrete nouns and assign it as the variable of the excuse me, and assign it as the value of the variable concrete underscore noun. And in our next line of code, we're going to declare a final variable, and this variable is called simile. So I'll pause here and say that when you are building this program with your students, it allows you to discuss with your students the different elements of, for example, a literary device such as the simile. And so for the sake of this project, I'm uh, basically saying that a simile consists of two nouns, one of them abstract and the other concrete, joined together by the words is like. Now, I know that in reality, similes can take a variety of other forms. Um, but just for the sake of <clears throat> this project, I've chosen to use this simile formula, if you will. Um, when you are creating this program with your students, you may choose to, to um, make that a little bit different. Um, so looking back at the code, we have our variable simile, and so we're going to say that the value of this variable is abstract underscore noun plus sign is like plus sign concrete underscore noun. And so then after that, we're going to have the program show us this simile by calling the print function. And so on our next line of code, we're going to actually have the word print, open parentheses, simile and close parentheses. And so that, that word print, that's a function. And when we, um, when we call that, we are actually saying, okay, program, I want you to show me the result of um, whatever is in the parentheses. And so we're saying, I want uh, the program to show me whatever the value of that variable simile is. Um, so when we run our program, we're going to see the, the the value of that variable simile. Um, and so if you want to go ahead and go to the next slide, at the top we have the word simile generator output. And so you should see um, uh, there's some kind of uh, file information in the first line, but then at the second line it says impatience is like darkness. And so what's happened here when we ran the program, uh, 
it basically just chose, like we talked about, some random nouns from those lists to join together with the words is like. And so this is kind of fun because um, every time I run the program, I have no idea what the abstract concrete nouns will be. Uh, the program will just randomly pull from those lists and, and pair them together there. And so this can be fun for students because once you've built that initial code, they can just keep hitting run and keep getting different similes. And you know, if you're in a group of students, you can uh, you know, compare similes and say, oh, what, you know, what did your, your program generate and things like that. So um, any questions or comments at this point? Um, I fully understand how it works. Um, I guess another thing you could do is, is for having is like, you could put a variable there and you could then put in some other things like is very like or resembles or something like that. Maybe even prompt students for that kind of thing. And then mm. if you pull randomly something that would go into the, uh, the what would you call it? The, the, the linkage or something like that. But there's so many mm. variations. And having students input their own, oh, you know, I mean, with, I know with the, with the LACL students I taught, um, you would get them to design elements. Uh, you know, in other words, you, you improve on the program. But anyway, mm -hmm. I, so when, when, are you envisaging that you just, that students use this program and then add words to it? Or how, how, do you, how would you have them use this particular program? Would it be yeah, for so, them? Mm -hmm. They would develop it. So, yeah, so once they've got the program in their, their coding editor, we would say, um, then they can just keep hitting run. And then, um, so this, what you see that in patients will like darkness, it, excuse me, patients is like darkness, that will come up in what's called the terminal. Um, so once you, so if you're running Python, you have kind of one screen that is where you're typing in the code. Um, and then, for example, in the code editor that I use, I have a green run arrow. And so when I hit that arrow, the program runs. Mm -hmm. And then it, it'll automatically bring up something called the terminal, and that's where you see this output. And so what students uh, would be doing is just, once they've created the code, they can just hit run as many times as they want, and then they, they'll see, um, you know, different versions of the similes that pop up, just depending on what the program randomly generates. I guess um, but I like your idea. Oh, go ahead. Well, I would also ask them to complete the sentence. So they get a simile, and then they have to complete it. Impatience is mm. like darkness. Mm -hmm. Why? You know, have, uh, impatience is like darkness, okay? Um, because you're always waiting without knowing what is there. I don't know. It's something like that. Mm. Get them to write a second sentence. Oh, interesting. So would you have them do that in the code or just as a verbal conversation? As a follow on, I suppose, with the students that I had anyway, you would, or I guess for anybody learning or taking English at this level, uh, it would be something interesting. You could just get them to, I think, as, if you have four inputs and four concrete, four abstract nouns, you'd have 16 combinations. So the more you yeah. add, the more combinations you get. So, um, but anyway, then you, yeah, I don't know. I'm just thinking of ways to develop the language. Um, mm -hmm. So one way I would think of to develop the language would be to have the students actually improve the code, and um, some might like to do that, or if they want to use other people's code, have them elaborate on the similes it produces. Mm -hmm. Just things mm -hmm. that come to my mind as a teacher. Mm -hmm. For sure, yeah. And I like what you said about how you could also create a third or an additional variable. Mm -hmm. And linkage, have that be randomly generated as well. Because yeah. then you could do things like you could have um, possibly different uh, conjugations of the to be verb, right? Because mm -hmm. right now I just have is, but you could, you know, change that up and have are or were or whatever. And mm -hmm. then instead of having like, you could have as, because mm -hmm. somebody can also use as. So yeah, there's some different mm -hmm. ways you could play with that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Um, great. So anything else before I move on? No. Let's see. What am I looking at next? 
you're going to tell us what natural language processing is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So now that we've had the chance to ah. look at a program that's using some of these um, basic natural language processing principles, such as um, language rules, let's chat just briefly about uh, what natural language processing is in sort of a larger context. So natural language processing, um, often called NLP, is the area of computer science that explores how computer systems can be taught to recognize and respond to human verbal and written communication. And so there are a lot of technologies that use this, um, that use this aspect of computer science. And so whenever you use a computer system that is detecting your written text or language like Google or Alexa, uh, Microsoft Word, Grammarly, Chatbot, or, or any other technologies, uh, we are benefiting from natural language processing. And in the slides, I have a couple of links to videos that explain a bit more about machine learning and NLP. So uh, machine learning is, um, you know, there's different things like uh, probability and statistical models that are part of machine learning that are used um, a lot in NLP in creating some of these technologies. And so if anyone is interested in getting into that a little bit more, there's a couple links in, um, in the slides. One is part of a Python tutorial. And the instructor, he just provides a little bit of background about machine learning that I find very accessible and interesting. And then the second link is from a, a professor who he, his main focus is on some of the challenges of NLP when working with Arabic. But at the beginning of the presentation, he gives a really good the sort of foundational introduction as to what NLP is. And then the rest of his presentation is also interesting also. But, um, so there's those resources. And then if you want to go to the next slide um, that says why at the top. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to kind of take a step back and look at, you know, why why is natural language processing or uh, making uh, programs in, in the learning uh, language classroom, why, or language learning classroom, why is that something that we should think about or consider? Um, so in our simile generator example, we used the rules of language and some simple code to write a program. And by doing this, we are using some of the principles of NLP at a very basic level. One of the really cool things about working with NLP or perhaps in any computer science discipline is that you can do some really simple pro projects like that, or you can get very complex um, and use some of those, uh, you know, statistical probability models that I mentioned to determine relationships between words and perform actions on them. Um, and as I've kind of already mentioned, um, it can be really valuable to expose students to some of these natural language processing programs for the sake of reinforcing their knowledge of the English language. Um, I haven't done any like, you know, peer reviewed scientific studies on this, but it's just, I'll just say it as my opinion um, that learning how to code uh, requires you to think categorically, just as you have to do when you're learning a new human language, um, when you have to learn about things like verbs and nouns in any language. You know, if you're learning English, you have to learn about these different categories. And then same thing in a, learning a programming language, you have to learn about uh, sort of the different categories that are involved in the terminology. And so I think that learning programs can reinforce that, that cognitive thinking skill as well of thinking categorically. Um, and as teachers, uh, you know, we might be interested in exposing students to computer science for the sake of helping them learn programming skills related to career interests. This is, of course, kind of more a tangential benefit. Um, I'm not sure exactly, uh, you know, what the, the trend is outside of the United States, but within the United States, there is a growing trend to push, um, well, not push, but to at least expose students to computer science even across disciplines. Um, and so if there is a teacher who's um, teaching English who uh, maybe has some sort of uh, interest in this or or maybe has some sort of institutional requirements or whatever to introduce students to computer science. Um, you know, integrating NLP in that English context might be a good way to do that. Um, and then if you want to go to the slide, I think it's right after that. Mm. Oh, yeah. So the slide that says using NLP projects to reinforce language knowledge. Um, 
So as I, I mentioned, I did write a 50-page curriculum that includes the instructions for the projects that I just talked about. Um, and this curriculum starts off with reviewing rules of language with students like parts of speech and literary devices. Um, and it's a document that basically functions as a worksheet for students to write in their answers to the grammar and the coding exercises. Um, after they review the language elements in the curriculum, I ask students to articulate the rules of those elements so that they can more closely examine them. And then after, after looking at those things, I then introduce students to um, some basic Python principles and guide them as they walk through the, the Python project. Um, so if you, you know, feel free to check out that curriculum and try out some of those ideas. And I'd love to hear any feedback on how, how you adapt that or, or how that goes. And then I think even if you don't use that particular curriculum, you can still kind of follow the basic flow using whatever specific materials you like. Um, you know, first, making sure that students understand rules of language. Second, having them articulate those rules. And then third, teaching them some basic Python. And then finally, having them use the language rules that they've articulated to write some basic programs. And that's, that's basically the flow and the philosophy that I use in the curriculum. So I think, you know, whatever specific materials you want to use, you can still kind of follow that, that philosophy. Um, any uh, questions or comments at this point? Yeah, I, I wandered from your slide. I clicked on your portfolio link. And um, I, anyway, basically putting that on the screen, I guess that's going on in the share. And um, so um, you were talking to, you, you, which part of your portfolio were you talking about? I think the, the introduction to natural language processing, the first one, the curriculum yeah. developed. Okay. But if I hit yeah. that one, so it's going to take me to a Word document that won't share. But I do have it highlighted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so you're in the right place. So that section, um, in that section on my portfolio, I have um, several different resources. Most of them are Word documents. Mm -hmm. The last one is a PowerPoint. Um, but yeah, it's all free for anyone to download and take a look at. Um, there's a document there, and it has the teacher version, and then I have a student version. Yes. And the main difference between the two is that, so um, I have some... Yeah, I have like some grammar exercises. And so the answers to the grammar exercises are in the teacher version, but not in the student version. That's really the only difference. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a list of resources. And then there is a PowerPoint there as well, where um, I've gone through, um, I mean, like I mentioned, when I was working at Tinker, I found a lot of parallels between coding and English language arts. And so in that power, and one of, one of those connections was natural language processing, but there were others as well, such as how learning to write a program um, actually parallels in some ways learning to write an essay. So for example, when you're getting ready to write, to write a program, you might put together some, some pseudocode uh, that's similar to writing an outline when you're doing an mm -hmm. essay. Um, and there are just some other parallels. And so if people are interested in kind of um, some of those um, other connections between English language arts um, or writing and coding, uh, that PowerPoint could be a good resource to, to check out. You said you didn't know how things were here. So I'm going to click on the link that says Teo Yuang Tech brings NASA and coding to Malaysia. So that should come up on the screen. And it is doing that. So here's a guy I didn't even oh, yeah. know he existed. <laughs> this is my country. This is where I live. Uh, so, That's it. yeah, and there's a video here. Uh, he's. Uh, uh, talking about teaching students um, computer science and why he's doing that. Learning code is very important for individuals. That's why I moved to, back to Miri to help prepare the next generation for the future. Okay, so anyway, basically, that's interesting. Um, I don't know if we can go through it all here. Well, anyway, I'm just looking at it here on the screen. Um, let's see, I'll go back to your presentation. Okay, so... Um, but I have connected with other people here in Malaysia who are also interested in teaching coding. And I was giving some, well, I was giving some workshops in uh, Thailand and Cambodia just recently, uh, January and February, and had some people from Malaysia come to the workshops. And uh, 
So I connected with them. But basically, they, and th those were workshops for English teachers. So the, the one I did in Malaysia, I'm uh, sorry, in, in Cambodia. Did I say Malaysia? I meant Cambodia. The one I did in Cambodia, I uh, recorded. I took the computer and I turned it. I, I put it in Zoom and I turned it toward the audience. So I got me kind of standing in front like this, you know, and then the audience, which was very substantial, interacting with the uh, the concept. So it was really interesting. I had them come up and talk to me about them. Anyway, they, we did a game and uh, whoever solved it would come up and tell me how they solved it. So uh, it's really interesting. I'll put the link in somewhere. I don't know if you've come across that. It's, um, I, it's really going to be kind of difficult to get at the link right now. Have you seen that one? Are you aware of that? Um, I've I've seen the video of you where you were talking about battleships. Is yeah. that the one that you're referring to? Yeah, so I, I watched In that. Cambodia, one. yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. so, anyway. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and my idea was that uh, you could teach. That was the, 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 that was from a set of materials for teaching coding as language exercise. So. Um, the ideas that you, uh, you uh, how would you sort? I think it was sorting and also search. That was actually a search aspect. So mm -hmm. how do you design something that will search? Uh, it gave a couple of different algorithms you could use, uh, pseudo algorithms, I suppose you could call them. And then um, uh, how many moves using one of these algorithms would it take you to find the battleship? So which one is the best one? So um, how would you narrow it down? You know, how would you narrow down where the battleship is? And that's what people were coming up and talking about. Oh, I found the battleship. Okay. How did you do it? You know, so anyway, it was quite interesting. Those were language teachers. So the idea is to give them ideas for, can you do this in your EFL language class in Cambodia? Would you get students mm -hmm. interested? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. There's so many different uh, ways that you can integrate it. And like you mm -hmm. said, getting them to talk about those concepts in English, like that, that's perfect for that, that you know, learning English context. Yeah, yeah. and the hook, the hook for those was um, teaching language through coding without a computer. So that's why I chose mm -hmm. those particular exercises. You didn't need a computer, I gave them worksheets. And they're exercising algorithms by uh, um, you know, just working on worksheets, basically. So they're getting the idea mm -hmm. of algorithms, and you could do this with students. And uh, coding comes after. I suppose that's really pseudocode. That's pre-computer pseudo. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I'm on um, the page. I'm on the slide that says my background. By the way. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say one more thing about that article you pulled up about the teacher in Malaysia. So mm -hmm. that is an article that I wrote while I was at Tinker. Um, I had the opportunity to interview that teacher. Ah. So it was kind of, yeah. So what happened was Tinker had a partnership with NASA and they did this whole summer coding uh, challenge basically where um, kids would basically code a mission patch within Tinker. So they would use the code blocks to make some sort of animation uh, you know, of, a, of a mission patch, a space mission mm -hmm. patch in Tinker. And then they would submit that to us. And then we uh, you know, chose some winners from around the world. Um, and then those winners got to have a video chat with a NASA engineer or someone else who worked from NASA. And so this, there was this student in Malaysia who was one of the winners. And so I got to talk with his teacher who had basically um, facilitated this whole project on, on their end and had helped the students uh, put together their projects and submit them. And so that was a pretty cool um, experience. And one of the things that was interesting, so um, at least here in the States, we, there are, like I mentioned, there are a lot of different learn to code platforms like Tinker, uh, code.org, and Scratch, and a few others. And so I think in the classroom, as far as I can tell, there's definitely um, kind of a general knowledge of, oh, yeah, we can use block coding, and it connects to English language arts because you can, um, you know, maybe make something that has to do with a story. And so you're 
you're using story time skills. And that can be a way that it connects. Um, but then when I was talking to this person in Malaysia, he was saying, oh, yeah, it's cool, you know, that Tinker has um, these different features available. But what we're looking for next is um, some classes that are appropriate for a school age audience, but that deal with more sophisticated topics such as data science. And so it was just kind of interesting talking to him and also kind of, you know, looking at what's happening here and seeing that there, there are some pockets and some areas where maybe students um, are ready to kind of take that interdisciplinary coding to the next level and not just do the block coding, um, but maybe see how it connects more closely with other disciplines, which I, is where I think, you know, what you, you've done um, in your, your work with English language students and maybe some of this natural language processing stuff can kind of help fill that niche. Um, yeah. So then looking at the last slide here, I mean, I, I pretty much already talked about this, um, but it just has a little bit more about um, my background and what I've done. And then I have the link to the portfolio there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think just on the last slide, I just have my email address and my LinkedIn and my um, portfolio so link as well. So, oh, yeah, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot so, shorter than yeah. before. <laughs> Yeah, okay. and so, yeah, so if there's um, anyone who would like to, you know, learn more about this, um, you know, I'm happy to, to talk more and, and see kind of what we can learn from each other in regards to this work. So, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm surprised nobody else came, uh, although I'm not well, I'm surprised, but, you know, it just because of the subject to, is so interesting to me. Um, mm -hmm. And, but, you know, and, and it's surprising sometimes what attracts people because we've had a lot of people come to most of our webinars, but I suppose, you know, coding kind of scares people a little bit. Um, mm. They don't know how to relate to it, but, you know, really, I think it's the, the wave of the future, you know, it's, uh, and that's also Jennifer Vershore who co-wrote co this article with me. She's, well, first of all, she's in, well, she should be in, well, I don't know, she's in uh, uh, Argentina which is your time zone. So, um, mm. but she's very busy. She's um, constantly doing presentations and things like that. And, um, so anyway, I'm sure she probably watched the recording in any event. So yeah. um, what, what are you, where, where do you go from here? What is your, um, do you have any, or do you have anything you can show us besides what we've, um, you don't have a text chat really, so you don't have, I'm wondering how we can, how can I get things from you? You could email them to me, I suppose. Email me links, I could put them in there. Yeah. <laughs> but do you have anything you show us that, uh, of a practical nature beyond what you've put in your slideshow? Um, no, I think that's about it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So you were just asking as far as going from here. I mean, one thing that I thought a lot about is, I mean, one of the, I think, inherent limitations of, of the kind of curriculum that I've written is that it does require students to download and use Python on a, on a computing machine. Um, but that is something that's not accessible to everyone, right? Because they don't have, maybe not everyone has computers, or if they use some sort of full issued machine they don't have permissions to do certain kind of downloads or whatever um, and so what would be cool would be to see uh, this sort of I these ideas um, translated into an actual product some sort of um, app or just online platform that uses the ideas and walks students through the project that they can just pull up you know on whatever device they have whether it's a smartphone or whatever and that has the, um, like a coding interface built in, which is what most of the learn to code platforms have is they have their own built in uh, coding interface so that people don't have to download anything separately. And so I think, um, you know, if I were to develop this further, that would probably be the next step. And so I, I've thought about it and I'm just kind of exploring some options on that front, but yeah. You mentioned, uh, I heard you mention Scratch at one point. Is that, did mm -hmm. I hear that correctly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Tell me more about that. 
Yeah, so Scratch is a um, a block coding language that was um, developed out of MIT, and I believe it was kind of one of the first um, of its kind. And I and because when I've looked at what Tinker has, a lot of the different projects that Tinker has that they invite kids to do are very similar to the Scratch one. So I don't want to say, oh, it's um, Tinker is just a copycat, but I, I will say that Tinker um, has, has like Scratch has been an influence on the development of Tinker, I would say. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's just a, a block programming language out of MIT. And what is Tinker exactly? Yeah, so okay. Tinker is a, a program. I mean, if you were to go to tinker.com okay, and if that. you were a, yeah, so if you were a student or a parent, you could sign up for a free account initially and then, you know, um, you can pay for some additional features later. But basically, you can just do different coding projects mm -hmm. um, using block coding mostly. And um, so a kid can put together different coding blocks and then they can, uh, there's a, a screen within their coding interface where they can see, oh, I put these blocks together and then this thing moves or there's some other effect that happens. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that's kind of their main product. And they, they also have projects where kids can do stuff with JavaScript or HTML or Python, some of those. So like the real world um, mm -hmm. programming languages and tools. Mm -hmm. And then they also integrate with things like drones and robots. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it, it has those types of integration. And um, yeah, they're, they're a pretty big player in this space. They're trying to sort of, at least when I left, they were trying to sort of shift from, from having their main uh, kid, kid base being in sort of the third set the maybe fifth grade range that was kind of like the target range was like those middle elementary grades they were trying to branch out and so they developed something called Tinker Junior which mm -hmm. is a program for kids who don't know how to read yet um, because the normal Tinker product has words written on the code block but so mm -hmm. with Tinker Junior it's, there's no words involved and so they just are basically putting um, you know different blocks together and they're still sort of getting that idea of like cause and effect but there's no like words involved that they have to read and then um yeah so when I left they were kind of trying to market themselves as like the K-12 complete coding solution and have things on sort of um, all aspects of that spectrum so um yeah I mean I think they're a fairly uh substantial player in that space and you're no longer working with Tinker. Right. Mm -hmm. And what are you doing now? Um, so prior to the pandemic outbreak, I was tutoring and I had been hired by a tutoring center and then the center shut down um, when we got the shelter place order. So now I'm just working at a retail, like an essential retail place. Um, while I'm continuing to apply for more opportunities in either ed tech or education. Okay, and so um, uh, you're you're are, are you looking to how how are you going to take these ideas into classrooms? I mean, obviously, yeah. you can go to so, the site and sign up for the the uh, courses or the experiences. Oh, it says mm -hmm. free access to premium coding courses during school closures. Oh, nice. Okay. So Tinker is allowing people access to these courses. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, ideally, I would love to work for a company where I can sort of develop this further. So, for example, I'm interviewing with a company right now where they do STEM integration. So, STEM being uh, science, technology, engineering, math. And so they, they create STEM uh, curriculum for different subjects. And so working in, for a company like that, I think would uh, be really amenable to bringing some of these ideas into the curriculum and into the classroom. Um, if, if I don't get a position that, you know, pretty, uh, where I can do that, I would probably just do it on my own and try to just um, 
build the product on my own. I've like I mentioned, I've looked into a couple of different options for doing that. There are some, you know, already built um, like instructional design tools. Uh, I think there's something called Adobe Captivate. There's some websites where you can um, pay them to basically host your online course if you want to go that route. Um, or if I wanted to build a website from the ground up, I could learn more programming and do it that way. So I'm just kind of trying to figure out the best the best way to build it into some sort of online platform. Okay. And you mentioned that you have built a course. So you probably have some some insight into into building courses. Uh, you mean when I was working, uh, when I was teaching LACL or now? Or, I, or the, uh, the courses, uh, I don't know what you're, you're talking about, the, the uh, oh, software I developed. Sorry. Oh, well, maybe I misunderstood, but I thought at one point you mentioned that you had designed an online course, but maybe I misheard. I was working at uh, a software company called Courseware Products International in San Jose. That's actually what I was doing there in California. Uh, we oh. made, um, we were working in authorware at the time. And uh, authorware, is that right? That's the the um, Macromedia project, the Macromedia I'm pretty sure it was called authorware. Anyway, I or, or authorware could be something else. I, it was, anyway, it's a long time ago. It was uh, 20 years ago. <laughs> so um, anyhow, we were working, we were creating um, software for language learning. And the, the concept we were working on at the time was developing a game where uh, someone got on a, train and got in conversation with the person sitting opposite him and um, the story developed from there he was he was in a scenario somebody had died I suppose and he was going to find out but he got involved in the scenario anyway there's a story there and the way the story progressed was you spoke to the person that you were interlocuting and um, the program picked up the it was um, um, not the kind of um, uh, speech to it was not the speech recognition that you that you use in robot tools where they're they they have a certain uh, set of well no I'm not okay basically uh, you had to, when you spoke it had to be something that the, the software would anticipate, then the software could branch according. So, um, and we, we developed a game which had an outcome. You could work through the game and you're speaking always to characters in the game. And I worked on the speech recognition aspects using the, uh, the software that we got from Stanford University. We were working with them. Mm. But anyway, so it was basically uh, a game where you interacted with people in the game, speaking to them, and then they would do something accordingly or come back to you accordingly. But it had to recognize what you said to them. So that means that uh, we'd actually put, uh, we'd, we'd prompt them. You could, have, you could choose from three different prompts. So you could, the person would say something to you and you could choose, well, I'll say this, I'll say this, I'll say this. But you had to say one of those things, and the, the software would understand what you had said. And it worked pretty well. Or the software would say, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that, or something like that. So, you know, so, um, and I had to work with that and make that work. That was my, uh, and, and we, we coded it in, I think it was, I think it was authorware, or um, hoping I'm not confusing it with somebody. You know, I think it was a macro media product at the time. And, um, mm. Yeah, so it was a, an, uh, a coding language that worked in uh, icons, and uh, you lined up the icons, the blocks, I suppose, and um, set parameters within the blocks. And we had a company that was doing that. We had a graphics artist who was doing that as well. So um, that was called Tracy Talk. And if you go to vancestevens.com slash papers, you could search for Tracy Talk and you could find reviews of it and things like that. Cool. 
Wow, that sounds super interesting. <laughs> and so it sounds like to build that product, you were using basically natural language processing, right? <clears throat> like if you, sorry. I got yeah, we didn't have to design it. Were ha- yeah, we were, we were using a, oh, a okay. end product, an end product that it was a Microsoft product that would, that was, uh, yeah, we weren't having, we, it was basically, uh, it was working on, on uh, allophones uh that when the it would pick up it, it could understand what people were saying as long as it said something that was anticipated as long as this the user mm. said something anticipated it could then detect that so we were having to tweak it to so that people it could understand what people were going to say so we said i'm going to do this and the user says i'm going to do this that's not i'm going to it's i'm gonna then I would have to mm. anticipate that that could be one option that this software would want to pick up. And we tested it with uh, in different countries. And I went to Chile, for example, to try it out there. And uh, it did fairly well with different accents, as long as the allophones were there. So, mm. yeah. Wow, but, uh, that's interesting. So, so did you have... Um, sort of like a, a repository or a list of accepted responses and yeah. then the person would say something and then you would basically check that uh, yeah. response against the, oh, the list. Okay. This, there was a multiple choice. So the student, the, the learner could say this, this, or this. So there are three choices and the learner had to say one of those. Or the learner could also say something else like Tracy. That's what Tracy talk is. Teacher ranging across the computer interface. So the mm. student, the learner could say Tracy, and they would bring up a, a PDA, basically a personal digital assistant that would then help the learner uh, interpret what was being said. So this, mm. But everything the learner spoke to it had to be anticipated. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't uh, understanding anything. Uh, it wasn't natural language processing in, in that respect. I suppose that would, that would have to work on natural language processing, but this was uh, basically just comparing what the learner said. In other words, you know, when a when a uh, when you talk to a robot on the phone and it says, uh, "What's your social security number?" You say, you know, four eight two three seven nine six or something like that, and the computer understands those numbers because those numbers are in its set that it's supposed to be. And if you if it if you go beyond that, you say, well, "What am I supposed to do?" the robot will come back and say, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that or something like that. So, um, and eventually they'll say, I'm, I need to pass you to a sales agent, which is what you're trying to get to do anyway. But anyway, anyhow, so uh, um, yeah, so those, that's an example of that kind of thing where it mm, yeah. has a set of responses that it's expecting and it can detect which one of those you said. But it's interesting to build that into uh, a... Uh, an interface where someone is trying to learn a language, you know, through going through a, a story. And uh, uh, there were lots of language help aspects built into it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, as far as, you know, designing a course for this going forward, if you have any, like, ideas on the best sort of platform to use, I'm definitely open to that. Um, or, you know, I've, like I, I have that contact information in the slides so if people like want to learn more about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's stay in touch. We we've, we've kind of talk to people. Yeah. There are not a lot of people doing this and we are two of them and there are others. And so, yeah, let's, mm-hmm. uh, let's keep in touch about this is, this is something I'm, I'm very interested in. Jennifer for sure is quite interested in it. Um, and you know, it's always in the, it's always on my back burner and right now I'm, doing a lot of webcasts and getting to know people who are in lockdown and what are they doing in lockdown and how are they helping each other cope with this situation. So uh, mm-hmm. that's the purpose of talent. But it's, it's yeah. so nice to meet people actually uh, online. And um, so sorry, more people didn't come and meet us personally or here in, that's in, okay. yeah, in the bits and bytes that we are. But we, this will be recorded, and you'll find it at learningtogether.net. Yeah. I'm backed up a little bit. I'll try to get to it tomorrow, but uh, 
uh, anyway, I have nothing on for the next couple of days. So uh, in t tomorrow or the next day, this will be online and, and blogged and you'll be able to find it there. Okay, that sounds great. And I'm definitely going to check out your papers that you wrote about that product that mm -hmm. you created Can you or that you were involved with. Can you tell me again the name of that product? Yeah. Teacher ranging across the computer interface. So that's T R A C I talk. And the company has gone defunct, and we have our CDs from there, but we can't get them to work on Windows 10 computers. So, you know, I don't know. Anyway, if you have old computers, you can get those CDs to work. But um, mm. anyhow, but it, yeah, it's a, it was an interesting concept. I worked on it with Phil Hubbard. I don't know if you know Phil Hubbard, Dr. Phil Hubbard, who was at Standard University, and he's a, a good friend, mm. colleague. So anyhow, uh, but it was really nice to, you, to talk to you about your work. And uh, this is Karen Schwartz that I'm talking to from California, where it's getting on about 8 o'clock in the morning. And me, it's getting on at 10 o'clock at night, which isn't really late. Um, anyhow, we've been talking for an hour, so I guess that's probably as long as people want to listen to a recording. And this is Learning Together episode, what did I say, 461, 461st episode of learning together but we just started talent so this is only the 14th episode of talent and uh anyway we're in uh may 11th 2020 we're in the i don't know how things going in california are you are you under any kind of lockdown because you gavin uh what was his name gavin the governor yeah yeah gavin newsom yeah we are so um until may 31st that's mm -hmm. the the current um, deadline, but even with that, there have been some lessening of restrictions. So, for example, um, people who are in the golf industries and the construction industries, those were some of the first ones to have some of the shelter in place and um, restrictions lifted, and as well as essential uh, or childcare for essential workers. Um, and then, so uh, I believe that they're just continuing to sort of gradually release some of the restrictions on different industries um, with the caveat that industries do need to have um, social distancing protocols in place as um, as the restrictions are lifted going out but um, are going forward but uh, yeah right now you know we're not able to return to activities like um, being in groups in public or you know being in worship places or schools or things mm -hmm. like that so most How is it in don't. Malaysia? Uh, Malaysia is doing pretty well, at least where I am in Penang. They haven't had any new cases lately. Uh, it's, uh, it's been declared a green zone. So the main thing now is to keep people out of Penang. So uh, the rest of Malaysia is a different story, especially down in Kuala Lumpur where there's lots of density and uh, people have different mentality. But here, here in Penang, people are, you know, they're, they're obeying the... Uh, we call it an MCO, Movement Control Order. So, and it's been extended to, to June 9th. But now I think in a couple of days, they're going to let us out for exercise. A lot of people have been doing exercise. I've been walking to other uh, townships near here and buying things. So uh, you can go out for food within a 10 kilometer radius. I don't have a car, so it's uh, quite easy for me to go walking. So, um, but it'll be nice to be able to go walking without carrying a shopping bag. Mm. Well, that's interesting. I mean, here it's, it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of funny because we've had the shelter in place, which technically means you're not supposed to leave your house except to go grocery shopping or go uh, take care of medical needs and things like that. Um, but we have been allowed to go out and exercise. So um, the trails actually, like the walking trails, hiking trails out here mm -hmm. have actually been packed, um, mm -hmm. more packed than I've ever seen them. And so, um, yeah, so it's just kind of interesting because so many things are closed and a lot of workplaces are closed, things like that. Um, and people are working from home and so they have more, more time presumably. Um, there's just, you know, people are going to the trails. And, and so um, there is, I think, 
kind of a risk there because they they do get to get they do tend to get packed. And so Mm. I usually wear a mask if I'm out walking out there Mm -hmm. and there's, if there's going to be a lot of people, um, but there's definitely people out there who are, you can tell, like they're just groups of friends hanging Mm. out and technically that's not allowed. So um, hopefully, I mean, uh, it sounds like being, we're, I mean, we're, we're definitely not like out of the woods yet by any Mm -hmm. means, but things are getting better. I think they're, are getting better based on the fact that they are lessening some of the restrictions but um you know hopefully we we keep going on that upward uh you know on that positive trend and we don't have like a relapse into into a a worse situation inevitably will be a relapse yeah one thing a little Mm. tip for you you know these little things that you put around your neck and carry conference bags or you know what i mean like a conference badge the little lanyard that goes around your neck. Oh, okay. You yeah. Take that and you attach it to your uh, to your um, mask. You can take your mask off and it's dangling there. When someone comes along, you can slip it back on again. So oh. I find that to be quite handy walking around town. And so I see someone, I slip my mask on really quickly, and I, mm-hmm. it makes it a lot more pleasant not having to wear it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it'll be nice. So like I mentioned, I'm working at an essential retailer right now. So I wear a mask when I'm in there and everyone's wearing masks. And it'll be interesting, you know, once we get to the point, if I'm still working there and we don't have to wear the masks anymore, it'll be like, oh, I can see everyone's faces now. Like just little things like that you don't think about, like being able to see other people's faces. People are going to self-regulate. I mean, me, I'm going to wear a mask. Mm. I just noticed when I go out, I don't touch anything. So, you know, before I would just casually lean on something, but you're walking down the steps, you don't touch the rails, you know? So like, uh, there's so many changes that you're making just mentally um, Mm. protect yourself, you know? Yeah. Anyhow, well, look, stay safe where you are. And- uh, Yeah, likely. Yeah, and we'll get in touch and and, and maybe find uh, we're on LinkedIn connections now, so um, mm-hmm. you know we'll we'll stay in touch and see if uh, there are any inter- intersections coming up. Yeah, and thanks again so much for having me on and for setting everything up. So, yeah, yeah. Wish it'd been more populated, but you never know. People do listen to the recordings, so anyhow, mm-hmm. we'll have yours up. You can play this, and you can. Uh, um, well, anyway, I'll let you know when it's up. Okay. Okay. Sure. Sounds good. Thanks, Vance. Sure. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good rest of your night. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.